PHNX Suns podcast brought to you by the DraftKings Sportsbook app, America's number one sportsbook app. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and leave us a five-star review. I'm Lindsay Smith, here with Saul Bookman, Espo, and Gerald Borgay. Gentlemen, I have a fun question for you off the top of today's show. Oh, really? What animal do you feel like today? Ooh. I feel like a peacock. Just let me fly, all right? <laughs> oh Other guy's reference. I like it. Yep. I'm an Egyptian water snake because I'm still in denial. But I'm, <laughs> I'm a holfin. A what? A holfin. That's a bottlenose dolphin who mates with a a, um, a killer whale. Yeah. This is like a real thing. Yeah. So they're sweet and they're salty, which is basically <laughs> what I am. I, oh my god! I thought, we were, I thought that was going to be one. What's a holfin? And then it was going to be something completely <laughs> inappropriate. I thought that's where we were going. So no, I didn't you realize kept it, it was real an PG actual today. No. Kept it real PG off the top. I'm proud of you, Saul. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, I mean, he did say a dolphin I've, does it with a whale. I know, so, that's, yeah. fair. I, that's as PG as we can get. <laughs> this is true. It's still progress. Progress is progress. I didn't think it was that bad. <laughs> it wasn't bad. I didn't say it could have been worse. <laughs> could have been worse. I'm a cat. I could use a nap right now. Okay, you're always a cat. You are a cat. Right. Right. You're forever for a cat. It's very rare that I'm not. <laughs> but, you're like uh, a 12-month bear is what you are. Because <laughs> you just want to hibernate all the time. You know, honestly, like a bear schedule seems like it would be much more like beneficial for my life oh, than know. like a human schedule. If you could sleep for six months straight, I believe you would. I think I would too. Hibernate, yeah. eat honey, maul some people who mess with you. Like, that seems like Lindsay. I need to be a bear in my next life. I need to be a bear in my next life. All right, gentlemen. Today we're going to talk a little bit of Cam Johnson. We've been kind of going down the roster a little bit the last few weeks. So uh, we're going to talk Cam Johnson today. And we're going to start with his performance this season. Some areas where maybe he exceeded your expectations. Areas where maybe he fell short of your expectations. Uh you could just go down the line. So you want to start us off? I, you know, based off of how he played um, in the finals last year, um, he really started. He really seemed like he was starting to kind of master all three levels. You know, three point shooting, driving to the basket, and then he was even showing off a little bit of the mid range. So coming into this season, I felt like okay, Cam's going to take that step. He might be that third or fourth scorer that we need off the bench. Mm -hmm. And for a long stretch of the season, that just did not happen. And right when it looked like it was starting to happen, he had his best game of the season, obviously, against the Knicks and the buzzer beater. And you're like, there it is. Like, Cam is on the verge. He misses the next month because of a thigh contusion. And then he just never really recovered from that. So I would say overall, um, it, based on my own expectations of Cam Johnson, I feel like it was a little bit of a disappointing season for me. Yeah, for me, I, I think it was a bit of an incomplete season because you got the first month and a half and he was in a shooting slump uh in part because he wasn't taking the shots when they were given to him uh then he had a, a real good run there where you went this is this is the cam johnson we thought we were getting he was one of the top three-point shooters in the nba he got snubbed going to the uh all-star game for for the three-point contest and then he has the injury and he never like you said Saul, never fully recovered from that, I think this is an incomplete season and very difficult to judge him uh, as a whole based on it, just because of of that injury and and kind of the slow start as well. See, that's interesting because I feel like you feel pretty positive about the season that Cam had. Like it wasn't the breakout season because you guys were a couple. I think you were and maybe you were too Solid higher stuff. on Cam coming into the season than Mikhail as far as like breakout potential for the year i think mm -hmm. that was you and i Lindsay. it could have been I mean, us we're, we're, I, I know it was two of you but um i that didn't happen obviously but he did you know he averaged 12 and a half points in 26 minutes a game that's pretty good career highs in scoring rebounding assists steals minutes uh field goal percentage and three-point percentage which was fourth in the nba like that's pretty good. He was taking six attempts a game. Um, you know, you mentioned he kind of got off to that slow start, and he definitely did. And it was kind of reminiscent of the close to last season, right before the finals, where he was dealing with that wrist injury, shot a terrible percentage. People were questioning, is he actually a good three-point shooter? And then he goes on to have the fourth highest true shooting percentage in a playoff run ever. Um, I think you feel pretty good about this because he was on a tear. I think obviously it sucks that he got – that injury 
and then he wasn't quite the same after that. But even in the playoffs, he still put up 11 points, shot 37% from three. It wasn't as good as he was during the regular season, but that seemed to be running rampant through the Suns roster. But, but so. I, I, I th- so my question to you, Gerald, is is like, uh, is Cam Johnson and, and even Mikhail, all mm-hmm. right, let's talk about this. Like, are they forever role players in your eyes or are they ever going to take that step to where you can, where you can count on them to be that third or fourth key piece, um, you know, in the future. And that's where my, that's where my mindset is that is like, okay, I'm cool with you being a role player your first couple seasons, but I feel like now we should expect more and you should take a, a more significant leap. And I know that he's increased across the board, but like, you know, listen, if he goes from four point fourteen point two points per game to 14.6, cool. But is that the jump that we're looking at? I want to see a bigger jump from Cam because I feel like he has it in him. Same thing right. with Mikhail. And and that's a good question because – but there is – we should differentiate because, like, you're saying third and fourth option on, like, a title contender, that is kind of like a role player. Like, there's not that much of a gap between those two target goals. I think with Cam – you look at what he did as a starter and you feel a lot better about his future because you're not signing him and we'll get into this. You're not signing him to be, you know, the six man of the year, this super sub guy that he was kind of this season or that we wanted him to be. He did finish third and six man of the year voting, but that was kind of just more because there was a lack of options. I think you look at the numbers that he put up as a starter. It was like 16 points a game. It's like 43 percent from three point range. And the Suns posted a good record. That lineup with him in the starting lineup, I think, had like a plus 29 net rating during the regular season. So, like, much more limited minutes compared to the lineup with Jay in there. But Jay's turning 32 over the summer. So you're signing Cam to be that starting four or that next wing alongside Mikhail Bridges for the long term. I think a lot of teams would kill to have one guy like one of those wings, let alone two, that can shoot and defend and also kind of play make in limited capacity. And Jay's an expiring contract too, so you right. keep that in mind. But I, I'm not disappointed in Cam. When I say incomplete, mm-hmm. I don't I, I'm not disappointed. What I saw when he was when he was fully healthy uh, excites me, but I, I don't think you can pass full judgment on well, can he take a leap or not because he was primed to. It looked like he was about to and that injury happen so i'm not going to sit there and and judge the guy on on kenny be that guy based on this disjointed season that he had due to injury so that's kind of my point is i still think we will see that leap from cam i think we were on the verge of it but we didn't get the opportunity to because of the injury i think for me it's like it's it's when you when i say disappointment it's not like a disappointing season because there was obviously growth throughout the season for cam I think it's disappointment in that I think he has so much more in him, but we didn't get to see that enough this year. And that's the disappointing part of it is that like, it's not that you or the season or what he did this year was a disappointment. It's just, I think my expectations might have been a little too high. You wanted the world for your sweet baby angel king. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and like he he did grow. He did get better. And that's a fantastic thing. And you want him to continue to do that. I think I just expected a little bit more growth. Was that stunted growth because of his own doing? Or is it because uh, da, da, the system? Like, <laughs> like it, yes it, and yes. It, you know, it, like, <laughs> no. I, I, you know, we kind of we kind of go all over the place with this. But, you know, I, let me go back to this real quick, you know. Um, what, Espo and I were talking before the show started about, you know, he said, oh, it would be great if the Mavs came back and were the first team ever to to come back from a 3-0 deficit and, and beat the Warriors. Let, and me, I said, let me clear that up. To make me feel better about what happened yes, is what yeah, I was yeah, saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, however, I was like, hell no. Like, I want the Warriors to sweep the Mavs because I want the Suns to realize that the Warriors were still the big dogs in the house and challenge them to get better this off season, I think we came into the season. People largely kind of were like, "Oh yeah, the Warriors. They're they're pretty good." Like they knew they were going to be better because guys were coming back, and and you know they would be, um, they would just be more productive than they were last year. But you know to get all the way back to the finals and possibly win it, um, I think people kind of slept on the Warriors. And when I watch the Warriors, there's a little bit of envy there when I see Jordan Poole and Andrew Wiggins, and they they go four deep. They have four guys where you can give them the ball and. They can get you a bucket. And Cam and Mikhail 
um, at times have shown you that they can do it, but not consistently enough like those guys. And that's where my my jealousy kind of comes in. That's where I want these guys to go is to find that level to where, you know, when you're talking about three and four guys, are they going to be – you said that they are role players. I'm like, yeah, but – those three and four guys are better role players than these three or four guys offensively, just offensively. In the playoffs, for sure. In the playoffs, for yeah. sure. And that's where it counts, right? right. And so that's kind of where I am. I think it's tough to compare Andrew Wiggins, though. The dude's been in the league I get for you. quite a I long time. And, I mean, four years is still a good, a, good, a good run. Yeah, but the difference was Andrew Wiggins was a number one option, albeit with crappy teams. He was a number one option before, so he had the chance to uh, – so was Oates offensively in, in, in <laughs> his earlier days where, where <laughs> Mikhail and Cam have been deferred options. You could also and, make the argument that if you're looking at the Warriors to the Suns, their first two years, three years or so, they didn't have veteran leadership on the team the way that the Warriors have veteran leadership. So they only have two years of true veteran leadership under their belt. Right. I don't know if that's... If that's a crutch, if that's kind of like a an excuse, if you will, well, but does it play but, a factor in but this? But to Espo's point, Andrew Wiggins played with a bunch of bums, and you could argue that Mikhail Bridges and DeAndre Aiden and Cam for their first year or two played with a bunch of bums, and here we are. I, I think it I think it goes back to two things we've already what? talked about. I was gonna ask you, are you calling Kelly Oubre a bum? Is he gonna piss off half a Suns nation here? Oh, Kelly Oubre has no business ever coming back to the Suns. So if we want to get into that, we can, but no. Like, I think it goes back to two things we talked about yesterday with McHale is that one, you know, Monty admitted he was thinking about watching these other playoff teams. Did I put them in enough positions? to where we can swing the ball around and one of our three to four guys just go get a bucket like you were talking about, Saul. That's something that I think will be a point of emphasis moving forward for this team. And then the other thing is if you look at this roster and we talk about wanting to keep the core intact, Cam is part of that core foursome with with Book, DA, Mikhail, and Cam. Those are the four guys that you that are young. He's only 26. The rest of them are 25 and under. You want to keep that group together. And if you do, you know, we talked a lot about how the Suns need to tweak the system, get more three-point attempts up. Cam is crucial to that. Mm -hmm. Like, if you put Cam in that starting lineup next to Jay, you're trading the kind of streakiness of Jay Crowder with more attempts, with a guy that defenses respect more as a shooter, and his gravity opens up things a lot more. So I don't think heading into this season he was ready for that role. I think Jay was still good enough to have that starting role locked down. But based on what we saw in the playoffs, maybe it is time to change things up a little, favor a more three-point heavy approach, and I think you do that with Cam in that starting role. I also want to go back to my Warriors point. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we do forget, and I do forget, that the Warriors with Mark Jackson had the same kind of guys, and they went through several years of you know, good wins, bad wins, some heartaches, some playoff losses and stuff like that. But they kept that core together, like you were talking about, Draymond, uh, Steph, and Clay, And then it, ultimately it got him a championship. And I know everybody's kind of down on the way we finished the season. And people were like, oh, DA's not a max player and all this other stuff. But, I, and I'll say this till the cows come home, you got to keep that core four mm -hmm. together. Like, if you want to win a championship in the next decade, I just feel like you've got to keep that core four together because unless you're going to trade for a superstar – that can instantly step in and take one of those four guys' spots to a whole nother level, which I don't feel like is going to happen. Um, it, there, it makes no sense to make, you know, lateral trades. Espo, mm -hmm. you seem to sigh there a little bit. Are you feeling a little different? I think you can make, and we'll get into this, it is Trade Machine Tuesday, but I think you can make deals that both keep your starting lineup at a fairly elite level and also help you bolster the bench because the bo what's going to happen here is you're going to run out of money, right? To be able to sign guys to bolster that bench. Yeah, you're that. Have to Tell the creative. Warriors that. They're $100 million in the luxury tax. Yeah. You know why? Because they want to fucking win. Great, and that's great. They have an ownership that will do that. We know in Phoenix that's not the case. They're not going massively into the hard tax. It's not happening. So you have to be – uh, fiscally responsible and figure out a way to actually pull it off. So that's why I think a deal might happen. But I'll say this, and I've said it multiple times on the show, I still think Cam Johnson has the higher offensive ceiling out of him and McHale. I think 
when you look at the strides he took defensively too, he's no slouch on that side of it either. Cam Johnson's ceiling is very high, and nothing that happened this year disproved that to me. I think he very much can be a, a huge part of a winning team. I, and I do think that we should acknowledge that just like Mikhail, if Cam got a little bit better at attacking the basket or at least did it more consistently, that would be huge because defenses are desperately trying to close out on him when he catches the ball in the three-point line. He has the ability to put the ball on the floor. We've seen flashes of it. We have. And and he's shot at least 71% at the rim in each of the last two seasons. So he's very good at finishing, but he only took 19% of his shots there. So that's an area where he could stand to attack the basket a little bit more, um, maybe take a little bit fewer mid-range shots because his mid-range efficiency dropped this season compared to where it was last year. Make him, you know, like a Houston Rockets player, like a threes and layups kind of guy. Um, and then I think you're unlocking the majority of his potential. And, and he's surprisingly athletic. I yeah, mean, Duke he can, is. can jump off one leg like nobody's business uh, and has posterized numerous guys. Mm-hmm. So, like, he has that a- ability. Again, can the system unlock it? <laughs> like, right. Monty, Monty's one of the guys that has to internally grow. Uh, if yes. we're talking about. And we talked yesterday about Mikel putting on a little bit more size to be able to handle some of that contact. I feel like. Cam has a little bit more of that size to be able to handle that. Mm-hmm. So, like you said, Gerald, if he can unlock that even more, then that's going to be a huge game changer for this team. And then also open up the the door for him to get to the stripe a few more times a game as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I guess my question moving forward is we all kind of agree that Cam is a good piece. And even if he's not a good piece, you still want to re-sign your pieces so that – like this this team's roster, if you look at their salary cap sheet – They have flexibility across the board. So if there is a superstar that becomes available for trade later on, they'll be able to have the pieces and they have all of their draft picks to make something happen. And I think re-signing Cam is a part of that, even if, you know, we think that he's going to be a long-term piece. You still want to re-sign him even if he's not down the road because that contract can be moved elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So I guess just off the top, what kind of contract value would you guys project for Cam? Uh, and I wrote all about this, but I am curious, just kind of your basic thoughts. I think seventy-five to eighty, okay, would be a range. You know, over over four years, where I go, okay, I can accept that. Especially when you look at what Mikhail got. You do a great job of breaking down similar guys in the article, but to me, I think it's that seventy-five to eighty. You could wind up locking them in and getting really great value, especially with the cap projected to continue. To go up, that mm-hmm. that's going to look like a bargain contract uh, that you could move, even if you decide he's not part of your long term future, or that you need to get another star in and you need a piece that that brings that value. Um, <clears throat> I kind of feel like they're gonna. I feel like because of what Mikhail got, I feel like Cam Johnson's camp is probably going to feel like we're on the same level as that. Mm-hmm. Minus, you know, I I know the defensive accolades that. That Mikel got even before this season, but um, but I feel like that's the kind of the target for them. Mm-hmm. So I would be shocked if they came in anything less than four for ninety. But okay. to me, my my pit value on him is about the seventy to eighty million dollar range. Like like Espo said, mm-hmm. I don't think he's I don't think he's any less or more than that. Okay. I agree. I think the Suns will probably push back on giving him something very similar to Mikel's, simply because even though they've stated multiple times that he is a starter on any other like multiple teams Mm. outside of the Suns team and that, you know, he sacrificed to be that guy off the bench. I think they're going to use that maybe as a part of the negotiation factor. And then, like you said, because we have, or Espo, like you had mentioned, we have to be responsible with understanding how much money we can actually spend and where, or they do anyway. I think they're going to try and get a little less for Cam than they did Mikel. I, I think they'll also use his hip surgeries as uh, as something to point to to try to and injuries it. in yeah. general. Mikel plays every single game. Cam misses multiple games a season. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I don't know if it if it's necessarily fair, but I think that's right. the way these negotiations go. Oh, it's fair. Just keep it's him away from oh, Mitchell Robinson. Fair. He'll play a full season. It's absolutely <laughs> yeah, I mean, fair. Mitchell Robinson it, keeps it, kicking his ass. It, it's a it, it's a concern, but I don't think it's to the point where. It it significantly devalues 
a guy like Cam. But again, I think we see a very similar, uh, you know, as they did with DA. I don't know that they necessarily get this done because it's going to be a, well, we want you to prove it kind of thing, which can backfire too. I mean, he could go out and have that big jump that we all expect and cost them a lot of money if if that's the case. But it would not shock me if they play that game. But again, I keep saying this, but it depends on who owns this team this this summer and if that changes at all. I, I, yeah, I, I think that's a fair point. We don't know what that kind of X factor might be as we head into the offseason. But I do think if you look at how quick, and I know that the Mikhail Bridges, Landry Shamit deals were announced on the day of the deadline for those extensions. But I really do think it's because they were waiting to try and figure something out with DA so they could announce them all at once. I feel like this is a situation where James Jones and company go to Cam Johnson's group and say, hey, here's what our offer is. Take it or leave it. And I feel like Cam Johnson's group might want to prioritize that security, that long term. Because Cam, I mean, all these guys say that they want to be here. But Cam has genuinely gone out of his way to praise like how much he loves the city of Phoenix being here, playing with this group of guys. His like, whole family is here. His whole yeah. family's here, him and Mikhail, the whole twin thing that they have going on. And Cam Johnson is a James Jones and a Monty Williams kind of guy, both on and off the court as far as character, work ethic, ability, like shooting ability, that type of thing. Um, I think it's probably going to be somewhere in the 72 to $80 million range when all is said and done for four years. Um, you just look at guys like OG and Nunubi, Evan Fournier, Tim Hardaway Jr., um, you know, Gary Trent Jr., they're all like $18 million annually. And that kind of feels somewhere near where Cam Johnson's value is going to come in. I'm not actually, weirdly enough, I was worried about this coming into the season. And for some reason, I don't feel as worried about that aspect of it. Because I think they want to keep Cam Johnson. It's the DA part of it, the equation that gives me concern still. I don't think they would pull the same thing with with Cam that they would with DA. I think they would get something done like they did with Mikel because the difference is is the amount of money said player is asking for. But if they pull what Saul suggests and say Mikhail is the marker and we want that ninety million and they're not and they won't back off of it, I certainly could could see it if that's the way way they play it. Now I imagine Cam's camp won't do that because yeah. he is a guy that, hey, let's get the security is probably um, the Isn't biggest he concern. represented by Devin's dad? I I honestly don't know who's represented. I feel like that's his by, agent. Let me let me look this like, up. Yeah. Right away. Hold on. Well, then Devin should pay the difference if there's an <laughs> issue there. He's about to make fifty eight million a year by the final year of his supermax deal there, so he can afford it's the to Cam do, Johnson right? clause yeah. in his supermax. <laughs> Here, I'm gonna give part of this to Cam, but uh, look, my I think my I know that. is it is it yeah. It so is, he's not de- he's not his. Uh, sole agent. It says here he's got multiple. It's his management. But Melvin Booker is a part of it. Yeah. Yeah, which is an interesting wrinkle too. But I wonder, and and sorry, I don't think this is on on the rundown. But I'm going to take us a little off the road. Uh, it makes me. I wonder, are the twins sustainable uh, together long term? Is that your three and four? And and can that win your championship if those guys are your starting small forward? And power forward because that's the way everybody's saying Cam's a starter. Well, power forward's where he's going to have to start. He's got Book at two, and Mikhail's going to be that three. Can you win a championship with Cam Johnson uh, in that in that four slot for you? I don't think that's the question though. Like I think you. Well, let me say this: if they take the jump that we need them to take, I think yes, absolutely, you can. But um, that's the question. I think more more importantly is can they make that jump? Can Mikhail and Cam, you know, control and take take control of of a portion of the offense like they're going to need to in order to jump? Especially if you lose Da. Like I know there's all these rumors about all these players that might get traded for Da or whatever. But if you got like let's say a Clint Capella that comes in, okay offensively you're not asking him to do much. He's just a roll. He's just a pick and roll guy, and he's going to get you some a lot of rebounds. Outside of that, you would need Mikhail and and Cam to take that big jump. Um, but that's and, my point because if you're committing, you've already committed 
to the McHale extension. If you commit to a cam extension at almost 18 million a year, you're basically saying he is our starting power forward. And if your window is now, can that win you a championship? And I'm not a hundred percent. Is your, convinced. Is your window I, now? It, I, I think a lot of people feel so, uh, you know, and, but that's, yeah, a, you can debate it, but that's the thing is I feel like you, a, I, I think the answer is yes, me personally, but B, you're not going to do better elsewhere. You don't have the means to go out and sign somebody else. Like you don't have any cap space. You would have to do it by trade and maybe you can find a trade that works out and we'll, you know, we'll dive into lots more trades moving forward. But like this team doesn't have a lot of resources to go out and just sign that player. But like, that's the problem. If you're in, we're going to blow it up that we're not, you're, you're, if James Jones, Monty Williams, they're ready to move on from DA, mm -hmm. the whole equation becomes very difficult to figure out, especially when it comes to Cam, because to Saul's point, what the hell are you filling the gap with? Well, but what are you doing now? But that's a like, separate question, I feel like, because your question was, can Cam and McHale, can those be your starting wings and win a championship? I think yes. I think it's easier if you have DA. I don't think it's impossible if you were to make a Capella move if you had to do something like that. But I do think even if you explore that for a year and it turns out you can't win with Cam Johnson in that role. Like, it's important to note, he's 26 years old, but he's only played three seasons in this league. Like, he's still it's developing. He played like 10 in college. That's yeah, why. but that's what I'm saying is he's only played three in the NBA. So, like, we're expecting these huge leaps. Like, he's been like a Devin Booker who's been in since he was 18. By NBA standards, he's a baby. Yeah, so like he's still figuring it Not out. By, if you look at the actual age, no, but yeah, and he like hasn't had a season as a starter. So like, I mean, but you also got to take this into consideration. This extension mm -hmm. will take him till he's thirty. Yeah, that's through and his that, prime. That's, that's perfect. It. What's wrong with that? Well, so, no. so he should in his prime, he should make that leap yeah, to yes. be a, a much better player. Right. But I'm saying, like, if we're expecting it now, like, why are we expecting it now when he's never started a whole season before? But that's that's my thing. I guess it comes down to is this the window? Like, are you saying, uh, yeah, like many are, Chris Paul's time and that clock is your window right now, mm -hmm. and if you don't win it now, who knows what happens? If that's the case. I don't feel that way, though. I, I'm not. I, I don't listen, think that I feel that if, if it's only I, if Chris Paul is here that we have a window open. Well, I will say this: like I've I've kind of gotten back and forth with what you're saying right now too, because I mean, shit, we saw the Spurs with a 49 thousand year old Manu Ginobili and Tony Parker mm -hmm. somehow win a championship, and right. and Tim Duncan, who was right. like damn near 40, right? <laughs> yeah. But they had other pieces, <laughs> Kawhi, mm -hmm. um, that could take over a game, right? And 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 as a team. Their system was so crazy good that they 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 were just a well-oiled machine. That's what you're hoping for with this. If you're going to have Chris Paul, who who commands the ball, who's who's largely your your main um, you know uh, initiator of of the offense um, at 37, and it will be 38 once we hit the playoffs next year. Is that is is the window with him, or is it with is it not? And I think honestly, in my opinion. And I'm going to say this, and it might be controversial. Um, I don't know if Devin Booker, Mikhail Bridges, and Cam Johnson are enough to win you a championship if you don't have a DA and and if you're relying heavily on Chris Paul. Like, I don't no, think it's totally enough. That's totally fair. But I, I think, like, I, I understand what you're saying as far as, like, the title window is wide open right now. With Chris Paul, and as his prime dwindles away, it closes slightly. But I don't think that post Chris Paul, the response is to then, well, we missed our window, we got to blow it up. Like you no. still have a core four. You, you would have been in a really great spot if you had drafted Tyrese Halliburton. I'll say that. Like if we had done that, Desmond the Bain. window's open for the foreseeable future. But that, but you need a successor. You need someone to fill in for Chris Paul. But I don't think the window closes. After Chris Paul, you just have to be very good at just replacing shut him. Just slightly. Yeah, but I, I, I'm i torn because we've seen so many times that, oh, there's a chance. Oh, we can. If the opportunity is there to get significantly better for the short term this mm -hmm. offseason, I would find it very difficult not to do that, even if it's at the sacrifice of Cam being on this team or and DA or DA. I think you have to go for it because we've seen how fleeting mm -hmm. those chances really are yeah. and how there's no guarantee 
three, four years down the line. Because what if what if you've gambled and Cam and Mikhail aren't the guys you think? Then there is no it's no like a window. Whole reset. And you No, but that's not true because if you're signing Mikhail to a, or to Cam to a deal that's worth like seventeen to eighteen million annually, that's a very movable deal. Like it, 26 teams in the NBA would take Cam on that deal right now. Yes, but it's very my, my point is if they don't live up to what you think they're going to be and you have to move them, then you're you're trying to shuffle and and hoping to build around Booker. If the right opportunity came up and you could deal Cam to get somebody, I would go for it in this window this this offseason uh, and try to do everything you can to maximize. That's kind of where I'm at. That's fair. I, I think, like I said, I think you explore everything, but I think you also bear in mind that like Cam's not a finished product. He's already very good at what he does now. He's a crucial three-point shooter if we're talking about this team needing to get up more threes mm-hmm. and tweak the system. And I do think like even if you re-sign him, you can still move that deal later on because like I said, like Davis Bertans is on a five-year $80 million deal. And he just got moved recently. Like that's because Dallas was desperate to get rid of a cancer. Which they it were can happen, uh, in a lot of a lot of ways. I I get it. I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. This, there is a value contract to be had here with Cam, and that's always important in the NBA. I'm just very, I'm very short sighted right now when it comes to the Suns because I'm at a mindset <laughs> where I'm like, enough of this shit. Just win a, <laughs> win a title already because that's the only reason you're in this business Mm -hmm. we've seen fun seasons we've seen good good runs but you're in it to win a title and if you have to sacrifice some of your youth to do that then go ahead and do it and i feel like cam might be one of those guys that you have to make the tough decision on okay so then let me ask this question yes or no do you think cam should be a part of this team's long-term future yeah Fourth in the NBA in three point percentage this year. Like, what are we doing here, guys? And, we want shooters, we, we want defenders yep. on the wing. He and does that. That's the second round exit. I could care less about stats at this point. Like, I it's just not even win. about stats. Like, every team in win. the NBA wants one wing, like a Mikael Bridges or a Cam Johnson. We have two, and we could have them for the long term. This shouldn't even be like a controversial thing to say. I look, like I said, <laughs> if the opportunity presents itself that you can get a proven commodity for cam then no he shouldn't be part of the future because you're gonna have to take some chances to win that title if 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 it's i want to keep him and you're trading da and you can get that kind of a piece or a few pieces to help you out then yes keep cam but i'm i'm on the fence in terms of how you get there and it's not cam specific it's just i'm on the fence of how do you get there? How do you get the Larry O'Brien trophy? Because none of the other shit matters. You know? I don't think anybody should be off limits except for Devin Booker this summer. I'll say that. But I do think, okay, if you have this opinion, like I, I would like to know, and I'm not putting you on the spot right now, but like, right, I want to know who are you trading for? What are you getting for Cam Johnson? Because it it have to be something pretty okay. good for me to give up and – on the future for right here and now. Let's go on the thought experiment train. <laughs> oh my choo, gosh. Choo. Let's do it, right? Uh, you know, people are obsessed with KD uh, at this point. Right. Uh, if if I don't think that window opens, but if it does and the price is Cam and DA, you're damn right I'm doing it. Well, you're not doing it during you're not doing it until later in the season cuz a sign and trade DA for KD is not going to work. So we're not talking about how this breaks work. down, Gerald. Look, we just want no, to say hypothetically. We're talking about hypothetically is Cam, is Cam the long-term play. Well, yeah, he could, also, he could also, you know, have a devastating injury in the offseason, and that could be his career. Like, we could play these games all day there's long, always, but, like, I get There's always a way to figure out the finances, right? And, and manipulate who you're sending where, get a third team involved. I'm just strictly saying you said – it, who are these people that you would consider? Well, Kevin Durant, I agree. Like that's yeah. a no-brainer. LeBron like, is another guy. Yeah. That it, and which I think is actually a. I mean, I keep going to it. <laughs> Saul's making actual, sour you can do that, right but now. I don't care. At this point, I'd hire all the mercenaries to win a you title. You would take da. I don't give a crap. You would trade da and Cam for LeBron. Because yes, I feel just like so we could get eliminated in, no, in, in like the second or third title. round and that watch the fucking title. Lakers just all of a sudden turn everything around. Let me say that oh I don't God. give a shit if the Lakers <laughs> oh win for God. the next ten years. If you win the title next year, you ain't winning the title with that team. I think you do. I think with Booker and LeBron, Booker, LeBron, 
CP3. Uh, CP3 McHale. Yeah, I think he can win a title with Depends that. on who you get at center. I wouldn't hate that, but I don't know. Like, the biggest problem in L.A. was Russell Westbrook. I'm not going to put any of that on LeBron, but it True. was... I don't know. LeBron We're, had a pie in the sky you aspiration. The oldest, you ask, yeah, you ask who those guys would be. I'm telling you who those guys would well, that's be. That's fair. It's but not. <laughs> it's not. I'm not going. Are they oh, moving the? If I could get Miles Turner, <laughs> let me blow the whole damn thing up. Are they moving the arena to Sun City now? Because we have the oldest the, freaking team in the, the league. What the hell do I care? If you get a Larry O'Brien, <laughs> they're trophy, not winning a Larry O'Brien. I don't care if you bring Melo no in way. for Christ's sake. Oh, you can bring in anybody. Just get me a damn title, is my point. Melo. So um, basically, Espo, you're one foot in, one foot out, yes. depending on the situation. Shocker. So how do you feel? You didn't yes. give us an answer, yes or no? Yes. So, yes? Okay. Yeah. So Cam should be a part of the long-term future. Wimp. I think there's I mean, something agree, to be though. said for there's continuity There's so many group. things about, like, like, Espo talks about the championship window. And, like, for the longest period of time this year, we all thought that the Suns were going to be the favorite. And well, at, at a minimum... At a minimum, they were going to get to the Western Conference Final. Right. And they didn't, it, like, they came close, but they didn't even come close is what it felt like. <laughs> yeah. Those four games and the way they lost those four games, it was so damn deflating because yeah. they never had a chance in any one of them. No. Any one of them. Yeah, they I cut mean, it to, the like, seven points, I think, in one of the games. Or, no, actually, it was a, it was a five-point game uh, in game four in Dallas. That was as close as they ever came uh, on the road. And then game seven was just a tragedy. But and so the, now you've got to sit back and look at this team and how everything unfolded based on what the Warriors are doing to the Mavericks. Who are you now? Okay. Like, and that's why I think the questions are are so all over the place in terms of should we get rid of DA? Should <laughs> right. we keep DA? Should we get rid of Cam? Should we not? You know, like, should we extend them? Uh, what's Mikhail's role? Like, that's why we're having these discussions is because nobody knows what the fuck they saw this season versus what they saw in the playoffs. And they can't put two and two together because it just doesn't make sense how this all unfolded. So you have to look at everything. So I would agree with Gerald when he talks about the only person that is non-expendable is Devin Booker. Everybody else, hey, it's it's open season. Look, to me, those three wins in that Dallas series, you thought they were unbeatable. It was the complete other side of the coin. You are one, or, one scorer, I think, one – Guy that can carry a part of the load offensively to winning a title if you get if you get that guy. If they win game seven and then they get their asses kicked by the Warriors, we're singing a different tune. This is all about one game, basically, and how it imploded and how it felt like the locker room swung in that. So like they're this team is still a very damn good team. Mm -hmm. They're still the core of the team that was the title favorite going into the playoffs. This is about tinkering to figure out how you get across that line not not com doing you know complete surgery it's not as if that slammed the window shut there's still a team on the verge of a title so the I'm, way I'm, things uh, completely freaking blew up uh apparently either behind the scenes or whatever like i don't think you guys are looking at the main reason why all that happened because da was a little bitch is what it sounds like <laughs> oh okay so money had nothing Sassy. to do with this either I think so. Monty, you might bring in all these other pieces, but what if Monty is the problem? So now we're saying the, the coach case. of the year okay, is the but problem. Time out. We're going to get into <laughs> Monty later. In the I don't week, give so a fuck about accolades. Too, too I don't give a shit if they were coach of the year. Mikel could have won defensive player of the year. I still would have bagged on him how he got used by Luca in, in, in that series. Like, it doesn't matter what your accolades are, it's what you do in the fucking playoffs because the only fucking trophy that matters is the damn championship and they didn't come close this year yeah, so what, are we kind of, who, what do i up. care about coach of the year it's amazing how you could turn that quick on a guy i did that, not turn on him just said i just said what if he was the problem <laughs> then you're making all these dumbass fucking decisions so to you're gonna replace all these if he's the problem yes <laughs> that's asinine that is the dumbest thing you want to get rid of da show. because you think he's a bitch I think that they all feel that way right now. Okay, because you know Monty. So you undoubtedly Monty know. At him. I, there's reports that he was asking. There's reports, but you undoubtedly year. know that this I didn't is the fact. Say facts. I was. I undoubtedly. So you know. undoubtedly know, know that Monty wasn't. It had no role in any of this. I think Monty had That's what very, I'm talking about. much less of a role than DeAndre Ayton okay. messing with the chemistry. Well, there. that role sure helped out in the second half when Da didn't even fucking touch the floor barely. 
and they still got routed. That's because he quit on his team as well. Okay, but, but hey, it, hey, but. it's all good. It's all good. They still got they lost they still lost by like what 40 at some point in the third quarter. Like, who cares? Look, I will say what I said Same. after game seven, and I've been saying all season, I think pinning it on any one entity is dumb. I think this team completely fell apart in every facet from Monty to DA to Book to CP3 to everybody on the roster bears a fair share of the blame for what happened. And I think it's natural for us to look at this dominant 64 win juggernaut and this seven and six, whatever record there was in the playoffs and be like, what the hell happened? But I, I just, I, th- I look at the other teams that are salivating at the prospect of DA at the prospect of Cam Johnson. And I don't want to overreact to one bad play. So you don't want to fire Monty. I don't want to fire Monty. I don't want to trade DA. It's so true. If you look on Reddit or Twitter, there are so many fan bases who are like, I would take DA in a heartbeat. I would scoop up Mikel or Cam in an instant. My my whole point was like, listen, if you're going to sit there and throw everything at DA, like, listen, everybody, everybody is under I, the microscope. I you can't right. let Monty just ride the fuck out of the goddamn country thinking that everything's okay because he won't coach of the fucking year. I just like, I don't care about that. he has to work on this system, that he's one of the guys it's that has It's not even just the system, growth. but it's also like, what the hell happened in the locker room, and how do you fix that? Because I feel like yeah. that's probably the biggest issue. If you get rid of DA and you still see the same shit next year, what are you going to say then? Well, then, then you have you know it's a larger issue. But they've talked about culture. We saw culture. One guy can change can change that sometimes with the way that they react. And look, you know I back DA. And if it's just DA, the basketball skills, I'm a hundred percent there. But the more we look at it, the more we see. I see a guy that just on the mental side of it isn't always there. Isn't is that, getting is it that done. based on? The entirety of the year or just one game? It's based on the entirety of his career and what we're hearing because about all we how heard, he's handled. Because all we heard all year long was, stuff. oh, you know what? DA hasn't brought up the contract situation. He's handled this we like a total hear, professional. We did not hear that from inside the organization. But what we did hear from we inside the organization it. is that he has been sacrificing, sacrificing, yes. sacrificing. Yes, because they had to acknowledge that because they knew – he was disgruntled. I, so when you say that, you say those is things. Is it because to try he's to, disgruntled or is it because he actually you're, you're did? You're just making assumptions on that point. What do you We're mean they knew? We're all making assumptions. <laughs> Nobody was in the fucking room. I'm going room. based off exactly what they've been saying. Everything has been an assumption. We oh saw Monty gosh. and DA fight on the freaking sidelines. They're saying it's internal. We got one word from Monty. There's obviously a problem. Okay, but it's didn't not a we big also, assumption. not to take us off on a tangent, didn't we also see Jay Crowder and Chris, Chris Paul, Paul have a yes. little like her yes. for a second yes. oh get rid of jay crowder so and chris how paul do you know that cancers. it was strictly a da Jeez. thing and maybe it was the team itself just had That's a bunch of issues there for a are, moment well, no i agree there's a bunch of issues but when you look at it where there's smoke there's fire we're hearing da's camp was asking out we're hearing that he was frustrated with his role which we understand i mean i understand why he'd be frustrated but to me a lot most of the time the simple answer is the right answer and the simple obvious answer is the DA had the problem i look i i think that there's truth to what both of you guys are saying and i hate to i don't want to be the person that constantly rides the fence but Put the i do, chaps do on it Jared. but i do it's so much nicer over here it's so much nicer over here not the fence chaps um <laughs> <laughs> but look I, I i do think that there's something to be said of him sacrificing of the praise that they gave him for doing that and not getting his contract and how much they did want him to get paid. And I wonder how much of it stems from them being concerned over this exact situation unfolding where the team doesn't win to the highest level. DA gets frustrated with his role. And now we're in this uncomfortable position where DA wants to do more, but may not be capable of being that primary option because he can't create for himself on offense. And I think you look at the difference in work ethic not to say that da has a poor work ethic but the the focus and the consistency kind of waning in and out that's something that would rub booker and paul and monty the wrong way and you look at the interviews that he's giving during the playoffs about how he stays up till 
two, three, four in the morning playing video games. Getting two hours of sleep. It's not a good look. And I'm not saying that he's not allowed to live his life and do what he wants to do and, and be a dad. And like he needs his downtime as a dad. And he said he couldn't sleep after playoff games because he was just too wired up. And I, I totally get that. I respect that. I'm not trying to say he's some like video game bum who's going <laughs> to blow his career by staying up late. But I do think there is a difference in the work ethic. And I think if you read the tea leaves on the stuff that Monty and the rest of the guys have said about him all season long, they encourage him to play with energy, with force, the way that when he plays to his best, when he does the little things that we talk about all the time, he's a monster. And when he doesn't do those things, it's very glaringly obvious that the effort or the focus isn't always there. And I think that's where the tension lies and i'm not saying that's the reason that they imploded against the mavs i'm not saying it's a reason that they should just dump him this summer but i am saying it's something they have to navigate and they have to see eye to eye on this and get past this because right now it does feel like a source of tension for this team and it feels like the main one and it i think it did blow up in game seven i love that you swung two feet onto my side of the fence and quickly threw one back <laughs> over here like nope, nope i'm not saying that that's <laughs> right i think the truth lies in the middle i don't think I, it's ever the you know, one or the other fair. extreme i think there are faults on both sides and i've said this all along i think the sun <laughs> should have given da his max before well, the season we and we could have avoided a lot of this that, they, that them not getting a contract Causes. figured out yes. could cause these type of the issues this thing. year right. Right. And, and they gambled. They and just did. lost. I'm just coming from it from like if I was in DA's shoes, right? Like I did everything I possibly could. Um, I I sacrificed. I basically got yelled at by Chris Paul for a whole year and got my ass chewed out every and single got moment. A lot better in the and process. got a lot better in the process. And I was phenomenal in the playoffs. And my guy, Chris Paul, who has been on my ass, is literally on national television saying he's about to get him a bag. Like, and so I'm feeling pretty good. I sacrificed for the team. I did everything that they asked me to do at the highest level. And I didn't get rewarded for shit. Uh, but Landry Shamit did, so that's fucking cool. Stop with the Landry Shamit thing. That's totally <laughs> I was with you on Landry Shamit. He got then, 40, if DA then, would have accepted this 40 year, million, they would have signed him real quick. And, this right? year, and then this year, you know, he's up and down. He's inconsistent. He has good games. He has you know, kind of DA games is what you call them. Cause they're just like, you know, six points and eight rebounds. And you're like, what the fuck? Um, and everything kind of just imploded at the end of the season. And now as we kind of expected, DA was going to be the scapegoat for a lot of this stuff, which I don't think is fair. And my point was, is that like, you have to look at everybody, not just DA, oh, yeah. because if DA leaves and you still have some of those problems or these dudes get housed by 20 in another fucking clinching playoff game, then what? What are you going to say? Is it is it now going to be the next person that has a run in with Monty Williams or the next two players that don't see eye to eye with each other on the court? Everything is on the table right now when you have an implosion the way that the Suns did in a record setting year like they did. Can they run it back? Yes. I mean, I is that oh, what you're suggesting? Should. I mean, I think, I'm confused. I, I think they should absolutely run it back while adding maybe a, one more key piece, like by trading. Like, I think Jay Crowder's got to go, in my opinion. But <clears throat> which is fair. Like, I I do I agree with you. I think you keep Chris Paul and that younger core four intact that we're talking about, and I think you tinker everything else. I think yeah. you need to start sacrificing this three by five index card depth that you keep talking about. And you need to get like another one or two pieces that yes. you can absolutely rely on in a playoff series because campaign wasn't it. Tory Craig wasn't it. JaVale McGee, yep. sadly, not it in a playoff series. He's going to get drop coverage to death in the playoffs. Like you need to have pieces, a seven or eight man rotation that you can rely on in the playoffs. And they didn't We're have gonna it. We're going to just keep rolling. You, you know I mean, what I know for sure? What's you know that? what I know 100% without a doubt? Uh, Transitions! Is that this show is nonstop action, ah! just like the Draken <laughs> nice. Sportsbook Look app it. during the NBA playoffs. So now. this week, <laughs> new customers can bet just $5 on back any team at the bit while she to was win out. and get $150 in free bets if they do. Um, right now, all customers can place a same-game parlay with three or more legs and get a free bet back up to $25 if one leg does not hit. So now is a great time to get in on the action at the DraftKings Sportsbook app. And when you sign up, make sure you're using that promo code PHNX because that promo code is what's going to get you those $150 in free bets after you place a $5 bet on any NBA team to win their game, and they do. 
Once again, that's promo code PHNX only at DraftKings Sportsbook. That is 21 and over only, Arizona only, gambling problem, 1-800-NEXT-STEP. New customers only, minimum $5 minimum deposit. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Also, a quick reminder, with the summer heating up and schools letting out and we're all going to start going on vacations and doing fun things, we want to make sure everyone is safe and healthy. COVID-19 vaccines are free for everyone five and older. Those 12 and older are also now eligible for a booster. Visit azhealth.gov slash find vaccine for a location near you. Here's the thing, guys. It is Trade Machine Tuesday. Well, However, it was. <laughs> no, it I, was. We I spent 50 up. minutes talking about a lot of things. Do we want to do a brief yes. Trade Machine Tuesday, and or do we want to split it in yes. half and do a we'll, Trade Machine we'll, Wednesday? We'll rip it. We'll rip well, through these real through quick. These. We can always crank the machine back up on Wednesday or Thursday if we need to as well. There's an infinite okay. trade of possibilities out there. All right. So first and foremost, Bleacher Report's Jake Fisher wrote an article about DA's restricted free agency. He wrote, obviously, that DA is expected to get a max salary, but sources are saying there's skepticism among league executives that the Suns would match such a lucrative offer. But he continued in his article with the question, what a package surrounding Clint Capella help facilitate a sign and trade to bring DA to Atlanta. So let's talk about it. First off, I think it's asinine that they're saying they wouldn't match a four year. It's smokescreen season. It's bullshit. I agree. 100%. They're not just going to let them walk away for nothing. No, no. They're not just going to go, eh, we're not going to do the four year. No, it's not happening. So let's take a look at some potential trades between these two teams here. Up first, we've got Clint Capella, Kevin Herter, Jalen Johnson, for Dario Saric, Tory Craig, DA, and a 2024 first round pick. Now, I want to throw the disclaimer out there because this was just me tinkering around with the trade machine this morning. I didn't have a ton of time to dive into like actual deals that would really make sense, but I did kind of like that one because like Capella's about as good as you're going to do if you're looking for a one on one DA replacement. It's not, he's not as good as DA. He doesn't bring as much to the table offensively but he would be the rim-running, screen-setting big that Monty and the system really likes, um, and he would be an improvement on the glass as far as rebounding goes. Then Kevin Herter is a shooter. We're talking about how this team needs to increase its three-point mm-hmm. shooting, how they need more wing depth. Kevin Herter is a good option there. Jalen Johnson's just a throw-in to max salary, um, but you would have to give up, obviously, other pieces Tory Craig and Dario Sharch don't really hurt you that much if you're giving them up. You would have to give up probably a first round pick in a deal like this, though, because if you again, if you look at the history of sign and trades, the returns are not that great. Let me just say, hell no. Like I just <laughs> I just I don't I, you're not getting the value back. I don't think it makes you uh, that much better at that point. I'd rather just go. We're going to match. We'll keep yeah. we'll, we'll sit there. Uh, and stand pat. I think there's better deals if you're going to pull a sign and trade. I don't know if there's better line. deals. I think if yeah. you have to trade DA, this might be as good as it that's, gets. And that's my fear. You that is absolutely brand. my fear is that right. you're just going to make a trade because A, you don't want to pay, pay DA mm-hmm. the amount you want to pay him, and B, just to make a fucking trade. Like it this just would be just make a, a trade. I, my mean, thing is, I, I think they all, all every single one I've seen so far <laughs> is just making a trade just to make a trade. As far as the sign and trade goes. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And we talked about it before the show. My biggest thing is here is that like you if you're doing it just to do it, like why don't you just hunker down, deal with whatever drama is going to come from it for until February and actually make a substantial trade. And you could say, yeah, but that could mess up the locker room. Well, you know what? We've dealt with really bad locker rooms over the last decade. You can do it for a handful of months in order to get something that's actually valuable. Hey, well, everything you want is on the other side of fucking hard. At least that's my heart, opinion. So just go through I just, it I just don't February want to be all right. But look, you know, I, and I know the last part of the show, I put it on DA. But you know what happens when you get your money? A lot of those problems dissipate. Yes. Because if his problem is, I didn't get paid, which exacerbates the my role on this team, if he gets paid, you have to imagine at least a, a large majority of that goes away in part. And I, you know, I'd rather take that gamble uh, and and see than, than settle for, for a deal like this. Yeah. All right. No, sorry, go ahead, Gerald. No, I was just going <laughs> to say the only place that Mo Money, Mo Problems doesn't apply is right. the National Basketball Association. So, 
Next up, this is another one that you kind of put together for us, Gerald. It's Danilo Gallinari, Clint Capella, and the number 16 pick for Jay Crowder, Landry Shamit, and DA. Again, the math is really tricky on this one because of the sign and trade rules. That's a tough one for the Suns. I don't think that makes you better. Again, these are scenarios where if you have to trade DA, if he tells you, I want out, I'm not playing here, I don't want to play here, and you have to work out a sign and trade, this is the type of thing should, that you might be expecting. They should put a cap, uh, like a cape on that piece of trash because that's super Look, trash. I, <laughs> see, I I prefer this one over the last one because you're getting, over the last one. Yes, because you're getting Gallinari, who's a guy that can. If your windows the next two years, you can get there. You're getting the, Hunter's a much better shooter than Gallinari. <laughs> it's not I, even close. I and then you're getting the pick. The this pick to me, you're getting you're getting a pick there where you're giving one in in the previous deal. If I got to do one of the two, I'm doing this this one. I don't like either of them. I think they're both crap. But if I if Thanks, I guys. have to do one of the two, it's the second one for me. Oh, Herder has so much more upside than than Gallinari. Gallinari was good in 2012. You're also giving away the draft pick rather than getting That's because it. getting Clint Capella back and Herder back in a sign and trade for DA feels like a pipe yeah. dream. I threw the first round in there in there because you yeah. probably would have to to get yeah, even get just, them to bite. I'd rather you're gonna. I think you can get more. I I, I prefer the second, but I don't. You think they can they get more? <laughs> yeah, I don't like either of these deals. I think but, they can do better. But if DA is no, no, okay. And for sure. financial purposes, a straight up for those wondering, a straight up DA for Clint Capella sign and trade does not work because he makes slightly too much money based on how much money they could get back for that type of sign and trade. So that's why that was not a suggestion. This is going to be a fun off season. Can't Ooh. wait. All right. Just next up, we've got Evan Sidery on Twitter tweeted out that according to Gambo, he's heard the Indiana Pacers would be willing to give up the number six overall pick in a potential sign and trade for DeAndre Ayton. Yes. So I know you guys talked about this a little bit last week, but now we've got, you know, a little bit more substantial rumors about it. So, Gerald, you came up with another idea of what a trade with these two teams also might look like. Yeah, it'd be Miles Turner and that number six pick for DeAndre Ayton. And that one actually does work out financially straight up. Um, but again, that's not a great return unless you really like somebody with that number six pick and you have no better option but to make a sign and trade for D.A., you're about the same rebounding wise. I don't know if you get worse defensively. I think you get worse rebounding wise for sure. Like Turner's not a great rebounder. And then which that you, was like a whole mess of a debate and conversation yeah. this yeah. past off or uh, postseason and even leading up to. Look, if you're going to do this, I'd rather they had done it at the trade deadline and gotten Sabonis rather than Miles Turner. If you're that interested in making a deal surrounding DeAndre Ayton with Indiana. You know. Again, this feels like massive settling, which I get if you're doing a signing trade. That's kind of what you're doing. Right. But again, this doesn't get you any closer to a title and doesn't help your financial flexibility. I think at the either. end of the day, none of these moves get you any closer to a title. None of them. That yeah. We've seen no. I agree. No, I, I don't think there's I, – and I haven't seen anybody propose a superstar trade of any sorts that includes DA. But um, I just don't think – that, again, that's why, you know, I think at first I was like, okay, sign and trade wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. But then you see the options, mm. and then you're like, hey, you know, when somebody once told me, you're only as faithful as your options. And if the options are not fucking good, you need to stay with what you know yeah. with Wait, DA. What does that mean? <laughs> Wait, so hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I'm sorry. You need to stay what? with what you know just because the options aren't <laughs> Yes. Yes. <laughs> at least I know I'm getting <laughs> some action with DA. I don't know about that. You're only as fellow, faithful though. as your options. <laughs> <laughs> Who told you that? Chris Rock said that on just, a stand-up one time. Just turn the lyric. <laughs> just turn the lyric. These hoes ain't loyal into a piece of basketball. I absolutely fit. I wasn't I'm at Disney World, but I'm it willing was a to perfect transition. I'm willing to guess that that wasn't in your in your nuptials. Oh there, my, right? in my in my vows. <laughs> your no, no, but the moral of the story. The moral of the story. Her ass off of what I said that. Yeah, you're only as good as your options, and I finally yep. found a decent one. Yep. Oh my gosh. Oh man. Yep. Well, 
I think this will be a really fun. That's why my wife loves me for me. (laughs) She just understands. We all love you for you. That's that's how it's got to work. That's how it's got to work. Oh, man. Uh, Tuesdays are going to be real fun moving forward. (laughs) How does that work? (laughs) Wait, what? It took me a second for my brain to get, like... That one was a that was interesting. Then you thought That's about it, you were like, <laughs> oh, oh you shouldn't have went down that road. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that's terrible advice. <laughs> I would never suggest that to anybody ever. Jeez. Words to live by. Jeez. All right. Let's wrap up this show. Please. It's gone a little bit long <laughs> Let's today. Let's spin that beautiful wheel. Hey, no, we're not doing that. Yes, we are. We need to wrap spin it up. Spin the wheel. Oh. Let's do I it. I like, we have to. Oh, we my have God. To. We got to end this. Oh. Let's go, let's go. Who do we got? Please not me. I, it's going to be me, Something and I'm really upset it's... about it. Oh, thank God. Who is it? I it's can't. It's Saul, uh, right? Oh. It's Saul, right? You really put me on the black tile? <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious well, right Gerald's now? Gerald's also oh, on the I black tile. That's, that's all Jacob. That's all Jacob. No, Gerald's on the black tile, I know, too. but I'm literally the only black oh, man on this on. show, and I'm on the only black tile. Hold on. He, Gerald's on it, too? That, I mean, the complexion, <laughs> Ziggy. The two, oh, my God. They put the two whitest people on the white tile. Jacob's going to get called the... Uh, oh, let's man. see what HR? Saul has to read the answer. Oh, what the hell do I have what to we read? Got. <laughs> Emma, you got to read it because we can't read that far away. Yeah, that wheel's got to get much bigger. You have to read it as a weather person, Saul. Hey, that's pretty stuck, good. Stuck in a storm? Is that what it's? Uh, yeah. Could be worse. Let's do it. Have fun. Could be worse. <laughs> what, what is the ad read? Here. Which one is it? This one. All of, all of that. <laughs> all yeah. this? Just all that. Right. It's not even that long. It's okay. just this. <laughs> It, it, it's supposed to be in the weather, we- like a weatherman in a hurricane. You, you've always seen the where they're like, "I'm out here live." Yeah, this has to be an Espo thing. <laughs> you got this, Saul. Yeah, you got okay. this. We believe in you. All right. Uh yeah. Stop by their local dispensary and grab some amazing uh, scratch made THC gummy. Wait, what? Yeah. Okay. Uh, from our friends at OGs. Look uh, out, so different flavors like blackberries and cream and watermelon. Perfect if you're in the mood for an uplifting sativa or a chill indica. If you're interested in trying the amazing, dis- amazingly delicious variety of flavors that OG's brand has to offer, go to OG'sBrands.com. That's OG's, O-G-E-E-Z, brands.com to find an OG near you. Back to you, Bob. I love that all you did was yell and then Espo did sound effects for you. Because I don't even know what that is. Like, that was spectacular. That was I awesome. That was great. I loved it. Fantastic. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, it was... Um, you know what I felt like I sounded like? I felt like I sounded like that one guy that gives you the updates on, on boxing. <laughs> like, yeah, I got a 10 rounds to nine there, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely 10 rounds to nine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just got to ask you one final question. Mm. Now that the show is over, what type of animal are you feeling like now? A tiger. I'm ready to fight. <laughs> So, he sounds like a sloth. He just wants to go rest. Oh, I just need no. a nap. A panda. No, I, was, I felt the rage tree come inside me. Whatever roadkill you feel like. rage tree, brother. I just say the lion. I just say a lion. That's what I feel like. All right. We've got two lions. I literally want to rip somebody's head off right now. All right. We'll go get some OGs. Bring it back. Back on down. Calm down. Chill out. You know, both of you. OGs and a walk. An office too. OGs and a walk. I think it'll serve you well. Thank you guys for tuning in. We appreciate you. We will be back tomorrow, Wednesday at 2 p.m. live on our YouTube channel. Uh, come join us. Come hang out with us. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcast. We greatly appreciate it. And if you want more information on Cam Johnson and kind of what this whole situation will or could look like, Gerald wrote a very in-depth article at gophnx.com. It's got all the numbers, all the comps, all the things that you could want. Um, So check that out if you'd like to dive even deeper into the conversation that we had today here on the show. Until tomorrow, you can follow me on Twitter at LindsaySmithAZ. You can follow Saul at Saul underscore Bookman. You can follow Gerald at Gerald Bourget. And, of course, you can follow Espo at Espo. Espo, take us home. Sometimes in the heat of the moment, you may call somebody a bitch. And then you regret it after you say it. Ahoy, hoy. Never gonna let go. BHNX, though. Lindsey Gerald Espo. Saw past the ball. We here to turn up the tempo. Got to understand me. I'll always wreck the family. Rally in the valley like Dan G. No plan B. Always on the job. My team move like the mob. Turn the beat on. I throw it down like DA on the lot. Best combo since KJ Marley and Charles. If you squat, just sit it on the